Here we go. Hi, guys. Um, so this is actually my first appearance at any Cisco event, uh, and I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, the Sunday is my anniversary. My wife and I, we celebrate 11th anniversary, so, and she is like a huge part of what I do, right? So I'm a maker, and what I try to do is I come home, after a long day of work, I take care of my kids, and then at night, I sit and code. And the way I do that is by reading the docs, trying to understand how other people do things. So I'm copying a lot. Um, but during the day, I work at Bank of New York Mellon, the biggest bank, um, biggest custodian bank in the, in the entire world. And I thank them for their investment in innovation. The fact that I'm here is uh, one of those things. And why I'm here, I'm here to discuss how to collect data for, um, how to collect network data for this AI, for artificial intelligence. This is a very interesting topic because I don't know anything about AI. So anything that I say, you know, check it in Wikipedia. But the basic of it, basics of it is artificial intelligence is something about cognition. And cognition, uh, there are a lot of functions in a cognition, like thinking. And one of the, the most, like, the hardest thing to do is to read between the lines. You know that sense that something is going to change, like you feel that, and this is why, because you inference, uh, or you're making inferences over time, right, based on the facts that you know. And that's what we need to teach our systems to do. Um, <clears throat> so what is enterprise networking? I'm coming from the enterprise networking space. I earned my CCIE. I've been managing networks for the past 20 years. I've been in technology for the past 20 years. I tried to get away from it, but it still uh, sort of got stuck to me, and I'm back to it. Um, so what is enterprise networking? It's like thousands of applications. It's not merely a portal where you, like, you support users and they hit one app. Um, it's basically everything that works in the background, accounts payable, money transfers, Swift, whatever it might be, it's huge. There is a lot of uh, storage, a lot of compute. Trying to move an organization, an enterprise, and I mean enterprise where you have thousands of users, trying to move them all to the cloud is like a huge, huge mess. Try to raise, like, I challenge you, try to, to open your AWS account and try to build 150 nodes, uh, compute nodes in AWS, you will fail. I guarantee that. Um, so. What's next for enterprise networking is big data integration. So we have a lot of, the, we work in silos in, in the network space and we really want to keep, like, uh, keep our data close. So we have our solar winds, net brains, whatever, and we don't want to share. That's, that's the, the kind of big concept. Um, so what we need to do is we need to take that data and give it back to the enterprise so we can connect things around us. And what, at the same time, what we want to make other people do is do the same. So share the data in a graph model. So for example, the previous conversation was about graphs. So it's sort of, I'm continuing there. So um, what are the drivers for, uh, for the next thing, for the big data integration? Because everyone wants automatic provisioning. They want to build everything like instantaneously without problems. They want business-oriented management plane. So in Cisco, there is something called data plane, so those ASICs, there's a control plane, that's something that interacts with devices, and there's a management plane where there are, there are smarts there. <coughs> and Cisco takes that model to a point there where all of those planes, they sit inside the same router. And now we, we all go to a decentralized um, model where we have data plane devices, then we have controllers and we have management plane. So in terms of Cisco, if you heard about uh, Cisco, data, uh, um, Cisco data center and network management suite, it's like both a controller and the management plane and it pushes configuration up to devices. We want predictive fault indication and repair. So what happens is, let's say you have two, uh, two links and you operate um, from a perspective that you have redundancy, but in fact, if you lose one link and you don't know about it, 
you're now in a state where you're, you're in a soft fault state, meaning you failed, but you don't know about it, and it will bite you later when the second link fails. So grab databases uh, and artificial intelligence related to that help you understand whether you have a backup. Um, automatic optimization is basically, OK, I have endpoint A, endpoint B on the network, and I want instantaneously know what do I need to provision in terms of routing, security, quality of service, all the way through. How do you do that? So <clears throat> you take two endpoints, and you figure out what's how can you physically go there, right? So layer two path. Then you go, do I have a layer three path? If I don't have, I build where possible. And all of that can be solved um, with grab databases. <coughs> so what are the challenges? A lot of processes and no continuous integration. So people on the business side, they're not catching up to IT where we have continuous integration pipelines. You speak about Travis uh, CI or Circle CI. They're like, oh, what's that? Uh, you have lack of automation and development skills, like we really need people, all right? So anytime you hear someone who wants to learn that, share as much knowledge as possible. So th they will be inspired to do the same. Uh, legacy infrastructure, <coughs> it's very nice when you have AWS, uh, but what if you have old legacy equipment that you bought from Cisco 10 years ago? And there is a lot of that. So if you bought a switch, it may not have an API, but what it has, it has shell, all right? So, and in a lot of cases, you don't even, you can't even get to it via SSH, you have to use Telnet. So how many people know about TL1? Anyone? So TL1 was a, a, a protocol to interact with optical devices that connect continent, uh, intercontinental optical links. So if you're in a big bank and you had that optical, like, uh, optical connection between, let's say, London and New York, that's what would you manage with, like TL1 was the thing. Now everything goes to APIs, but that's a slow, <coughs> slow migration. Now, lack of willingness and methods. <coughs> so if I don't want to share, I will not share. And likely that other people um, would not be able to get data from me, so they have to have a ways to figure out what I know, and that's called organizational knowledge. That's what people have. That's what provides job security. So how, that's a challenge, because some people don't want to share. So how do you overcome the challenges? So <coughs> you use some kind of orchestration tool to collect the data. So data is power, and that's what provides you the basis of knowledge about what's going on on the network. Then you take that data, you put that into a Git repository, you source control it, so you have a timestamp on everything, and that basically takes the image. Why do you need to do that? So later on, you can always come back to that raw data and redo whatever you're doing, like reanalyze that to apply AI in a different way. Maybe you, you later on will have better tools. RDF tribbles. So there was a question before about how do you actually create those connections uh, between um, uh, two nodes uh, in, let's say, Node.js. Uh, so the way how you create connections is with resource uh, RDF. And we'll, I'll speak about that. How do you query that data? You use one way to do that. Now for j doesn't have that, but I use personally Sparkle to do that, to retrieve that data. How do you, how do you um, provide people with access to data? So there is a thing called ontology. Ontology is a description of data uh, that's machine readable and it helps, like there's an enterprise ontology that basically each department creates their own ontologies and they describe all those relationships and nodes um, in a graph database. All combined together, it allows someone to go into that ontology, it's a file, we'll see that, ontology and basically understand like, do they have the data that I need? So let's say if I go into ontology and I search for an IP address and I cannot find anything related to IP address, chances are there is no networking information in, the, in that ontology. It means the organization doesn't, uh, would unlikely be able to provide like statistics related to like metrics related to, um, uh, to networking in their big data platform. Uh, graph databases, that, as discussed, um, so now for j is just one. 
and you saw on the screen, I think the performance of it, when you try to put a lot of nodes, let's say it cannot draw 60,000 nodes on, on one screen. It's just a limitation of JavaScript, it just doesn't work. But w important to understand that uh, graph databases are not only uh, those visual links, it's also a data set. You can represent data as columns. And that's what, um, that's what you have to, to th when you think about graph databases, it's not only graphs. It's, it's regular tables, too. So how do you gather uh, data? So um, that I took from someone, copied, all right? So friends don't let friends dig through data. So <coughs> my nights I spent creating something called Network Discovery and Management Toolkit. It's something that, uh, coupled with Ansible, can provide you a data discovery in a smart way. So ordinarily, we were collecting data using Rancid, where we were prescribing, let's say, show IP route, and we'll collect show IP route and then we'll store it. The problem is that if I try to do show IP BGP table and I try to discover all my neighbors, and then I want to, uh, to collect routes that I received from neighbors, I cannot do that with Rancid because Rancid doesn't know the IP addresses of the neighbors. And if you have enough neighbors, you cannot ty type them manually. Uh, so that's how I thought about uh, creating um, uh, this toolkit, because I thought, like, let me do something that would, uh, would, would accomplish what I need. Basically, what I want is a lot of data all the time, continuously and predictably. So here's how we do that. <coughs> Ansible, that's a sign there, a sign. There is a plugin. It's a, it's a Python file that basically acts as a bridge between Ansible and Expect. Uh, and then Expect script interacts with individual devices. Not only it can interact with devices, it can interact with anything. Um, and that's what we'll go <coughs> into through the next slide. It is all about eyes, not a APIs. It's all about interfaces. There is nothing that makes me more happier than me being able to access a database via Unix, uh, Unix domain socket without a password. And when I dump that data, it like really like feels really good. All right, so when you, think about, when you think about interfaces, that's what you have to think about. So there's web browser impersonation. Someone who doesn't provide API, okay, let's try to figure out how their, uh, how their web interface works, and maybe I will be able to subscribe to some feed that they publish out there to get that data. There is message bus subscription. So for example, you see it on privileged account, you see it on the system, and you figure out for yourself, okay, how do I get the data from the system? So there is an operating system, there are message buses. So theoretically, you can hook if you have privileges. And because our system are mismanaged in a lot of cases, you can hook yourself up to a bus and listen to the messages that, that get exchanged. Same about um, operation systems and uh, application hooks. So what is expect? It's an interactive program. If someone heard about TCL, it's that. So Years ago, it allowed us to basically wrap around some kind of executable and being able to send a command, wait for certain output that we can predict, and send another command as a follow-up. So <coughs> what's an interactive program? SSH, Telnet, curl, wget, minicom. So it's like if I want to use this to access a console port, Let's say I have physical connectivity to a terminal server and I want to configure a device that doesn't have IP, anything configured with it. I still can connect to a terminal port and now interact with the terminal port via some kind of serial connection. <coughs> More, um, right, so we are, all right. So the system is built in the following way. So inventory is like a regular Ansible inventory. Think about orchestration tool and inventory. Playbooks, this is what you need to do with the data. It basically tells like instructions like what do I want to get. Credentials vault, if you store any time you use management system like orchestration system and you put your credentials in plain text, um, uh, you basically don't care about security. So Ansible this ha has this thing about Ansible Vault, and it allows you to basically put encrypt your data, encrypt your passwords. Uh, the thing is, 
it doesn't have a good credential system, so I developed my own. It's uh, basically, it's in the code. You can go in and it's called callback plugin. So whenever Ansible starts and executes the task, there is a hook there that you can attach to and you can read, read through some external data, let's say like that file, and you will be able to uh, get credentials to access devices. So in theory, you can have your credentials that match regex expressions for all sorts of devices. And they can have priorities and you can read about that. So in the interest of time, I will just continue. Data collection is very simple. You say, this is like, this is data collection against a firewall. You say, I collect all relevant output. I output that to a path. I don't want to check uh, SSH keys. And if there is an error, I want to continue because you want to fail. Um, <coughs> data analysis functions. So data analysis functions are based on the following. Uh, there, is, there is a bunch of YAML files in that, uh, in that repo that provide the basis for the, for the algorithm to discover new commands to run on a device. So a basic premise, you run show running config or show version, it gives you an information there. Let's say router BGP, you know that as a follow-up command, you want to run show IP BGP summary. And, if you, and then after that, after you run summary, you want to run commands against neighbors. And that's uh, what I call derivative commands. Factors, so in Puppet, there is a thing called factor where you run a command against it, uh, like before you run any job on Puppet, you discover facts about it. So I created a similar thing that would match a regular expression and it will either add facts or have existing facts there, right? So in, in here it's OS, uh, OS vendor, that's Cisco, OS name, OS class. Later on you can match against those facts in, in the patterns. So sometimes you need to set a prompt because expect works with prompts. It needs to know prompts. Uh, so you would set prompts, you would set an exit sequence. So for example, if I'm against a Linux box, what I want to do is I want to clean up my history. I don't want to like people know what commands I, I run. Um, especially, uh, I will do with uh, output full filters. So you would want to, sometimes you collect the data and you know there are passwords there. So you will basically put a, a filter replace saying, oh, this is like username. If you see a line of username, remove the line with uh, zero, zero output and that would, you will avoid uh, unnecessary data exposure. So reference ta tags and data logic, the way it works is, <coughs> The concept, you have some tag that says to you that that's a configuration. And then once you have that tag, you can correlate uh, later on in a game, you say, if I have tag binaries, so for example, I run a command to find all the things, all the binaries in my path. I can later on say in the rule that I, I want to run OVS uh, VCTL, basically open vSwitch commands to get the overlay information. It will only run if the binary output had something to do with open vSwitch. Error handling. I want to fail, so I describe, describe what is the output that commands would fail. So in this case, if I see a warning, that's a failure. Uh, exceptions, some commands, you would see that uh, inherently you would see the the failure, one of those is show tech. Show tech is a collection on Cisco devices, is a collection of a lot of commands, and some of them would fail. So here's an algorithm. You take configuration, you take basic sets of command line, uh, basic uh, sets of command line sets, and then you create a lot of derivatives, and you go and you dig deeper. There is basically uh, all the operating systems that have commands there, so you can check it out yourself. And here's an example about show IP BGP route. There are derivatives there, um, important things like uh, once you match a pattern, there is a, a certain derivative pattern that goes with it. In the interest of time, I will just skip to graphs. Um, so how do you store data? When you output, when you produce reports, it produces reports, you have to provide metadata. Metadata later on can be captured by AI system and you will be able to get metadata in JSON and YAML and later on you would correlate. That data is important because it provides description for what you captured. Um, 
git commits, branches. So do that. Anytime you produce the data, make sure you integrate yourself with Elastic, uh, Elastic Search, push the data through API. JUnit files, generation of JUnit files. So here's how you do the graphs. So there is an XML and there is RDF. Um, RDF is a format of triples, so there is node node connection. Here is the interface, here's a router interface, um, let's say a property and some value that was associated with it. So the connection, the connection there would be, it, it could be a property, the middle ground there, like configure uh, configure them to you. 9,000, so it could be either a property of an interface or it can be a relationship to, uh, to a property. Here is how you can see that in, in a different representation. And those like different data can be also correlated in triples. Ontologies, so this is, uh, this is a, someone created an ontology and published that on the web enterprise grade. Uh, I advise you to, to look into that. And here is uh, Sparkle, Sparkle inserts. How, that's how you da get data in the, in the graph database. You basically, you say, you create um, a resource entry. It's like a URL. So instead of ID, you, it's a URL. So you have, to be, you have to create those URLs, and then you create the properties. So this one, you created a dot. This one, you created, before that, we created a, a device. Here, we created an interface. Here's how we connected the two dots. We took a resource identifier from one node and the other, and we connected it by a relationship. So my time is over. I um, beg you, please take this presentation and look it over. If you have any questions, please reach out to me. Thank you.